I received a lot of encouragement from you guys, so I like seeing what y'all put up there too. I've been into prepping one form or another since the 70s. My grandmother is uh, was the wife of a banker who somehow they survived in a little East Tennessee town through the Great Depression. And my grandmother kept telling me, it's coming again, it's coming again. It's still an unstable system. And uh, so from when I was a teenager, I was stockpiling food. Uh, I moved to Arkansas in 83 to get away from the big city and uh, moved out onto a little five-acre farm. Well, it's a little play farm, right? But five acres so I could raise my own food and at least, at the very least, uh, be able to be self-sufficient if it got crazy. Planted fruit trees way back then, uh, cleared some land, built a house. Solar was not a factor back then, except for passive solar, unless you want to spend tens of thousands or probably hundreds of thousands of dollars back then. In the last 10 years, solar has dropped in price 90%. Um, largely due to the fact that all this Chinese production is going on. Automation and slave labor do amazing things to prices. So we can benefit from that. I want to know where I stand right now. How many of you guys have some active solar going on at your house right now? So many of you do. How many people are over 100 watts? How many people are over 500 watts? How many people over a thousand? Okay, I, I know where we are. For those of you that did not raise your hands, let me tell you what the what the playing field is, what we're facing in the future potentially. Our, we are completely dependent on electricity in our life for our communications, for our lighting, for refrigeration, for our, our heating and cooling. Goodness knows what all we are, even medical devices if we have CPAP machines and such. They've got us kind of entrapped in this electrical world. So that means they control us. And that's not an accident necessarily. We are vulnerable on our electric grid in a lot of different ways that you maybe haven't thought about. We are uh, vulnerable to it militarily. An EMP popped over our country is going to mess us up. Um, even uh, military strikes on power uh, facilities and stuff like that will mess us up. Natural events, as we see right now with going on in Puerto Rico, they lost 100% of their grid and still have big segments that are powered down. Natural events such as earthquakes and hurricanes and in Arkansas, ice storms gets us every year, doesn't it? People die every year in Arkansas to ice storms. They freeze to death in their houses. Um, solar flares is a natural event. The Carrington event that happened in the 1850s, goodness knows, when that happens again, we're probably going to be in serious trouble. Um, political, political vulnerabilities. You know, we're a part of the country that didn't vote right. <laughs> Stalin shut off the food to Ukraine and 20 million people starved to death. Um, they can flip the switch to fly over country anytime they want to. Um, we can be punished for uh, going the wrong direction in that thing because we don't control that. And of course, terrorism. You know, in central Arkansas, you all remember a few years ago that fellow hooked up that big cable to, a, to the power grid and then stretched across the railroad tracks? Broke back down an entire high tension system. Uh, they caught him by accident. But what if terrorists, just high power rifles shooting at those things, random places? You could disable an entire city overnight. It all takes one person and a rifle to take down the grid. So we are vulnerable. But I'll tell you my own personal story. It's none of the above. I'm in retirement three years, ready or not, money or not. I'm going out of this, this grid system. Financial is a factor, too. You know, I don't know if this can be Social Security around. I don't know if my investments, my retirement savings is going to be there or if it's going to have any value if they devalue the dollar like they probably will. So I need to be able to keep the lights on. I don't need to have a $5,000 electric bill because I just turned on the space heat. So financial is my motivation. It's my retirement plan. I want to be able to call energy up and say, come get your meter. I can, I can do without you if I have to. Solar is still expensive. Even though it's dropped 90%, what's dropped 90% is just the solar panels. But that's not the main part of your system. What can you do with 100 watts? My house has 100 watts of solar. One solar panel, I pay about 100 bucks. Gordon has essentially the same thing. 
What I, my whole house is wired like an RV. If I got 12 volt RV lighting in every room, I have 12 volt television. By the way, it's a regular TV you get at Walmart, but it uses external power support. I'm always looking at power supplies, and it, it runs on 12 volts natively. So guess what? I don't have to use power supply on there. It plugs directly into my into my system. Even my Bose home stereo is natively 12 volts. Um, a lot of things run on 12 volts you don't realize. So I run my house on 12 volts. Lighting, all communications runs on that. Uh, on the uh, the battery charger over here for your flashlights and radios, they all run on 12 volts. So what can you do on 100 volts, 100 watts? What I do daily, every day, every light in my house runs off grid. My television runs off grid. My cell phone has never been charged off the grid, or on grid, since I put the solar system in. I mean, initially it did. But I can run my computer. I can run my um, internet. Uh, all that stuff can be run on 100 watts. It's the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that has to have electricity. Can I run my air conditioner? No. Can I run my refrigerator? No, not for, for a few minutes, maybe. Can't run space heater. Can't run my water heater. Those things are just not going to happen. But I have backup plans for those. There's other ways to do those things. Canning instead of refrigeration and freezing, for example. You don't have to have electricity to can. That's what you can do with 100 watts. Guys, I have about $500 invested in my entire system. Is that doable? I did it $50 a month. 10 months, my house was wired. Puerto Rico still has a big chunk of its grid down. There's a lot of reasons why we could lose the grid. And the reason I haven't selected a generator is because long term, long, long, long term, a generator is not sustainable. It'll make life a lot easier and quicker. Everything that you have plugs into it, right? But long term, it's not your answer. If we're in that serious, serious situation. But we talk about it being solar, but I want to tell you the truth of the matter, it is not a solar system. Solar is just like the gas pump. It is really a battery system. You've got to think of your system as battery. You invest in your batteries, and those prices have not come down 90%. So it's still expensive to install a solar system. But understanding the battery that is appropriate for whatever your application is extremely important, and that's what you should spend more time concentrating on and saving for. I uh, have a true deep cycle 12 volt battery, and I have a marine battery in my barn. And both are six or seven years old and working fine. They're full voltage. They do everything they're supposed to do, but I treat them with kid gloves. I never let them get below 70% charge. Um, you have to treat them right. Now, the McDormans over here have a, tr they don't, they're not on a small system, they're on a real system, and they have some industrial batteries that's going to outlive them. My batteries, I'm lucky to have gotten six, seven years. If I get another three years out of it, it's going to be amazing. But uh, you're running a battery system that is recharged by solar. So always think of it that way. Invest enough in your battery, concentrate on that. That is the heart of your system, not the solar panels. So this is really kind of the wrong talk, right? So solar is what keeps that thing topped off. On your sheet that I handed you, can I take a look at that? I want you to kind of take a look at some stuff that you can do. Most people are used to running things on inverters, and that's fine and dandy. There's a few devices I have I can't run on DC. So I do have a small inverter to charge power tools and stuff with. But I try not to use it. I try to run everything DC because you don't have um, a loss in the inverter and in the power supply in the device. So every time you convert electricity, you lose a little bit of it. So take a look at the first two items there. The inverter TV pulls six amps because it's losing power twice. It's losing power through the inverter and it's losing power through the power supply and the television. Drop down one TV, that same television running natively 12 volts. Instead of running um, five hours, it runs seven and a half hours. Make sense? Uh, and you can kind of look down the line there. In my house, the overhead lighting in every room is a 4-watt RV, warm white light. Uh, 
about that big, cost me $13 for every room. Uh, that's enough to light up the room, enough to move around in it. I have standard wall switches in my house. Gordon's seen this. Yes. Have normal, normal switches. In our house, the old grid lights have one set of switches with the ivory plastic wall plates, and the, the solar ones are, have got the same steel plates. So you can tell which one's on grid, which one's off. Every room has two light fixtures in it. That's not enough light to read by. It's kind of dimish. It's probably about equivalent to a 40 watt light bulb. I like it actually. I think it looks like an old farmhouse. But uh, for places that you're doing detail work, I have a lights that are mounted right like underneath the kitchen cabinets and stuff, two watt lights. But because they're right there next to the, what you're working on, it's plenty of light. Um, I think you've got Turner Ab told me about these uh, these work lights out in my barn that are 20 watt LEDs that run on 12 volt volts and they are perfect for a workbench. And they're running natively 12 volts DC. Um, you can see a lot of those things on there. Some of these things, like a DVD, VCR, may have to run it off grid depending on what equipment you have. Finding a 12 volt DVD player might be a little bit hard. I'm sure RV supply stores have stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not interested in that stuff, so I didn't research it. But a 7 watt light, you can see it can run 50 hours on, on a battery, on a 100 amp hour battery, which is a pretty typical size of marine batteries. I want to go back into batteries for just a second. A 100 amp hour battery, multiply that by 12 volts, is a 1200 watts hours that are in that battery. But do you have access to 1200 watts? You really should only have access to the top 30%. If you draw it below that 30%, <coughs> you're starting to damage the battery, you're starting to shorten its life. It has so many cycles that it can go through. If you deeply discharge it, particularly on these marine batteries, if you deeply discharge it, you're beginning to damage the battery. So that's why I have my personal rule of 70% charge before I you know, get really aggressive about conserving. I have never got to 70%. I've never even come close. So, um, but it's possible if you push it. That's a 12 volt light bulb. If you want to convert your existing fixtures to solar, DC, Google and Amazon or whatever, Edison base, 12 volts. Now this one will run on 12 volts AC or 12 volts DC. So that means you don't have to watch polarity when you're wiring it up. But some of my fixtures in my house have these. This particular bulb has about the brightness of a 60 watt light bulb, and it's over our kitchen table. So I like it. It's warm white. It looks like a natural incandescent bulb to me. I've got some also ones that are cool white ones, like you see. Kind of to me, that looks like fluorescent lighting. Uh, you've got that in your kitchen. I don't know. That's kind of harsh on my eyes, but it is good when you're doing detail work. So that's in my utility rooms and places like that, my workshops and all my pantry. And they're identical to that. They just have a different look. This one can be ordered. Um, let's see how many watts. I had to write this on here so my wife won't accidentally pull that plug into a grid light. But um, this one, this particular one's available at 5, 7, and 9 watts. This is the mid-range 7 water. So you can see how far you can go on a 100 amp hour battery and not encroach on your 30%. You go 50 hours with this one. So that's a long time to have light on without any solar input whatsoever. So that works great for us. We've, like I say, even at this low amount of watts, we've never pulled our battery down too low. It's something that's scalable. It's something that you don't have to do all at once. Start with a good battery. And then Gordon and I started the same way on this. We got a little trickle charger. Plugged it into the grid, kept the battery full, and then we started adding lights and appliances and stuff as we went along. And find that Gordon beat me to the solar panel. But when you can get your money gathered together for the solar panel, then that replaces the trickle charger. But I still have my trickle charger ready to go. So if we had an ice storm, no solar output for two weeks straight, my voltage is dropping too much, I'll plug that trickle charger back in and we'll get that battery top back off. I came up with that idea when I saw what was going on in Iraq. The terrorists were always taking down the grid in Iraq after the war. 
And so these people going around the junkyards and something getting car batteries, putting them in their garages, hooking up car chargers to them. The power would come up and charge their batteries up, power would go back off, and then they could run their TVs and stuff. I said, ah, oh, that's a pretty good idea. So they load shifted, and that's basically how I started my system, was using what these Iraqis were doing. All right, I'm just about finished, believe it or not. I'll just talk about the equipment. For those, is this all new to you? How many of these people are pretty new to you? Okay. Let me just go over the basic components of a solar system. The battery is your most important central thing. And you can start your solar system without a solar panel by getting a good battery. From that, it needs to go to a fuse block for each circuit, just like in an RV. And in fact, you can go online and find RV fuse boxes. They use a standard automotive fuses, not expensive, 10, 15, 20 bucks. And that works as a distribution panel, just like a car would. So this fuse can go to those lights, this one can go to the TV, this one can go to your computer, et cetera, et cetera. You just wire it up like you would a, a car or, or a boat or an RV. Uh, and then if some circuit gets overloaded, you just replace the fuse, solve the problem. Um, the heart of your system is the battery. Then you have your, comp uh, your components. Uh, Google RV accessories, the people that do dry camping in their RVs are excellent at this. They already know how to do it. Get on the RV forums, take a look, see what they do. Because they're trying to extend the life of their battery too. They're far away. They're starting to have solar panels these days. But they know how to keep the current down. They know how to keep that voltage up. They know how to sustain as long as possible. So I just let them figure it out for me and I do what they say to do. But it's common sense. Keep the watts down. Um, then you can buy the different devices such as the lights and stuff. I have these little 12 volt sockets that you plug in, cigarette lighter type things. There's several of those strategically around my house. That's how my, I set, charge my cell phone. That's how I charge my Bofing. That's how I charge a lot of stuff. I have those places. Super cheap, four or five bucks at Walmart. You're ready to go. And the life expectancy of your battery depends on a, not discharging it too deeply, and B, keeping it maintained in terms of keeping the water levels up, use distilled water. I have to check mine about once a month. I don't have to add much at a time, but I do have to add some occasionally. And, and be concerned about hazards. Uh, don't want to burn your house down. On your, on your chart there, you see uh, a wire uh, gauge chart there. You know what works for me? Check this with a couple of electricians. It kind of scared me, but it seems to work. Speaker wire. 14 gauge speaker wire. At Radio Shack, it was $30 a roll for a 50 foot roll. At Home Depot, it was $17. At Fred's, $4.95. Same stuff. So I've wired my whole house with speaker wire. It's not code. Don't know anybody turned me in. <laughs> but. Uh, it doesn't get the wires hot. I'm only pulling four watts on each wire, so it's working great. I think it's going to be fine. Um, but you do what you got to do. I'm not endorsing that. You make your own decision. Last thing I want you to take a look at, well, two more things. On Ohm's Law, anybody comfortable with what this little chart is, the little two circles there, the E and the P and the I and the R and all that stuff? What you do is you want to figure something out, take your thumb and cover it up. So if you want to know what the voltage is, Voltage is electromotive force, which is represented by the letter E. Cover up the E, and that means you multiply the I times the R, the current times the resistance, and that tells you the voltage. Or you want to cover up, find out what the current is. You take the E, you see that's over the R, you divide the voltage by the current, or the resistance. But the one that you're going to be using more is the pi chart, PIE, see that? If you want to know what the power it's drawing is, multiply the current times the voltage. That tells you the watts. If you want, if you know what the voltage is and the power is, but you want to know how much current is being pulled through it, cover up the little I with your finger. And that means you divide the watts by the volts, and that tells you how much current is going through that wire. That's going to help you when you figure out which, what gauge of wiring you need to have for your house. Makes it simple. And then you slip over and take a look at the gauge of the wire chart there. The last thing I want to say before I go about that is there's a lot of good ways to. Um, to measure state of charge, and I do just to go right next way, I monitor the voltage. 
So, and that's voltage not under load. But you've got appliances running on it, it's pulling the, the pressure of the electromotive force down. It's pulling it down. So that's not a real voltage read. Turn everything off, let it rest for about a minute or two, and then see what the voltage is. That's probably pretty close to your state of charge, and you'll see it's a percentage in here. My advice, keep it above 70%. Then your batteries will last a long time. Does anybody have any questions? This is your $50 a month prepper plan to get off the grid on the main things that you need to get by. That it really just can't be replaced by anything. You can't have a, a wood-fired television, <laughs> a propane-powered cell phone. These are, these are the devices that really just electricity does best. Yes, ma'am. I'll just make a comment. It's not a sure. question, but like the way you started your system, we started with a Harbor Freight. Uh-huh, me too. It was a 60 watt, uh -huh. and it came with everything you needed, the yeah. wires and the frame and everything, and that way you don't put out a whole bunch of money, and you play with that and, and get it tweaked. And we still have those panels. We, we took them and we gave them to our daughter, and she's got a little system now set up in her little off-grid house. So. If you're that scared, if you're not sure about all this stuff, just go get you the kit, and then you can play with that, and it'll help you learn. I, I, I'm glad you brought up Harbor Freight. I meant to mention that. That was my first system, and that's what powers my barn. It was a 45-watt system. Mm -hmm. I've got it. At that time, it was a, when I got it six, seven years ago, it was a heck of a deal. Oh, yeah. But now it's not. Right. Uh, now they've switched out for the same amount of money. They've got a 100-watt system. And I'll tell you the problem with that system is, in those seven years, two out of three of those panels have failed. Uh, they're, made, they're framed in plastic. It, I, it occurred to me that UV was going to eat those up, and it sure did. They've all degraded. The plastic is cracked, and they filled with water and shorted out. I only have one. I'm down to 15 watts in my bar. It's still enough to run the thing. That's amazing. But I should have painted them to keep the sunlight off the plastic. And it occurred to me even then. But I was in a hurry to get them up, and I did it. But um, yeah, I'm going to. You talking about the kit? You can buy a kit with real solar panels, with real frames and real wires and real everything for less money than Harbor Freight. So just get on our get on um, eBay, eBay, Amazon. Mm -hmm. There's there it, basically going what right rate right now seventy five dollars seventy five cents a watt. Yeah. So look for that. Yeah. Now, well, oh, I'm digressing again. One more thing. I heard this on the news today. President Trump is trying to get industry back to America. And one of the ways he's doing that is talking about putting tariffs on it, manufacturing stuff overseas. Mm. Well, the problem with that for us is it's going to double the price of solar panels. So now's the time to do it. Go on and go buy your solar panels because if those tariffs do come, it's going to go from $75 a watt to $2 a watt overnight. Right. All right? You tell Thanks, guys. Real frames, are they aluminum? They're aluminum frames, yeah. Not platinum, not this PVC pipe. <laughs> Plastic stuff. I'm glad I got them. It got me started. I'd do it again, but nowadays don't do it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.